She is the CEO and founding director of Fuji's Family Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that uses the power of soccer, education, and community to empower refugee children to successfully integrate into the United States. She's also the head of the first accredited private school dedicated to refugee education in the country. Please welcome Luma, <laughs> welcome Luma Mufla to the studio. Thank you for coming to the South by Southwest EDU studio. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you because my daughter's love language is soccer. So um, I wanted to hear your inspiring story of how you began with a surprise soccer match. Can you tell me about that day? Yeah, um, I was born in the Middle East, so I'm uh, originally from Jordan. Um, I came here when I was 18, and so um, the, at some point I ended up in the South in Atlanta. I'm going to skip that part. And um, I was going to a Middle Eastern grocery store to get authentic pita bread and hummus. And on my way back, I made a wrong turn, ended up going into this uh, rundown apartment complex. And outside, I saw some kids playing soccer. They had rocks set up as goals or playing barefoot. Um, it reminded me of home, like of the way I grew up playing soccer in the streets of Jordan with my brothers and cousins. Um, I came out later in the week, this time armed with a soccer ball. Um, approached the kids. Uh, they wanted the ball. Um, I wanted to play, so we haggled, and they got in their little huddle and discussed amongst themselves, and reluctantly at some point said, okay, you can play, but you're on their team, and <laughs> we just started playing. And the boys I initially met were from Liberia, Afghanistan, and Sudan, um, and I started making excuses to leave work early so I could play every afternoon, and um, at some point I said, have you guys ever been on a team? They hadn't, and so we started our team and literally drove around in my like Volkswagen Beetle, showing kids a soccer ball, and tell them five o'clock show up to the field, and that's how it all started. Oh, what yeah. serendipity! That's yeah. so beautiful. Did you know after that soccer match that educating immigrants would be your calling? No, not at all. Like I, I'd coach club soccer, but I always had like a job, and you know, soccer was like a pastime, but it's like something I love and brings me joy. Um, Slowly, the players would ask me, hey, coach, can you help us with our homework? And initially, I was dismissive. It was like, go get your parents or your siblings to help you, um, not realizing that they were illiterate, um, not only in English, but in their home languages as well. And so I'd start helping them with homework. And there's this moment that shook me. Uh, one of my players, you know, he's like, uh, coach, I have a headache. Can you read to me? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. He was like, good kid, didn't cause trouble. So I read to him, filled out his worksheet. Second day, he did the same thing. So by the third day, I was like, Louis, I have a headache. And he's like, no, I have a headache. Can you read to me? I was like, no, I have a headache. And it felt like 20 minutes, but I think it was like 15 seconds max. And he looked up at me and said, coach, I can't read. And that broke me. Um, he'd been in the country for two to three years, had been getting A's and B's. My players had shown me their report cards to play. Um, and my parents sent me to British and American schools growing up in Jordan, and I naively believed every school in the United States was like my State Department-run high school in Jordan. And I just said, if this was my kid, what would I do? Um, I couldn't send him to a private school, couldn't afford that. It was actually cheaper to start a private school. So six kids, one teacher, church basement, and that's how it all started. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean. Tell me about the effort it took to open the Fuji's Family School. What are some of the biggest obstacles you've had? So opening it, I don't know. I like it. Maybe it's the immigrant mindset. It's like you just get stuff done. Like you, you figure out, or so you do it, right? And so it's like I went to my landlord, like where I rented my apartment from. I knew he owned commercial property. I was like, is there any room you can donate to us? And he's like, yeah, I've got church basement. You can have it for one year, like, and then we're going to sell the property, but. And so it's like, yeah, just ask, right? Just, you just ask. ask. You, What's the worst that can happen? They, they can say, say no. no, and then you go to the next person, yes. you know, or you come back to them. And, and so it was like, like I didn't see, it's like if you want to do something, you just do it. Like don't, don't find excuses not to do it. Now that's inspirational. How's the school fared since you opened it? Um, any particular highlights that make you smile? You got good stories, yeah. so I know you got one. Yeah, no, I mean, it's... Um, <laughs> You know, so we opened you know, the Georgia school, then we eventually opened a school in Columbus as well, but um, it's the small things, you know. It's like we had this uh, one kid, um, my players read their report cards to each other, and so he had arrived in the country. Three weeks later, it was report card period, and he stood up, still couldn't read, you know, and had the page upside down, and so we sat him down. Um, 
and then six weeks later, report cards came out, and he got up, and I mean, he had like three C's and two F's, but he read, he read it, and the entire room just kind of stood up, started applauding for him, because they were all there, you know, when he first got here and didn't know how to read, and then with the right support, he was starting to read. Um, you know, seeing kids that their parents didn't finish middle school or finishing middle school and graduating high school and um, changing the trajectory for their families. It's like all these like small moments um, and when they rally around each other. Yeah, that you know? positive reinforcement yep. from your community. Yeah. It, it just it's, gives you superpowers. Yeah, yeah. it's like you, you think you're invincible, right? So you've got that original school. Yep. And then you, how, what, what are your expansion plans? How many do you have now and what, what's your Big What's goal. the big goal? What's so the big, big goal? goal is, is to eliminate the need for our organization. Yes. Right? Like, that's what nonprofits should be doing is they should find a problem to solve, solve it, and then go find a different problem to solve yeah. or retire, right? Um, and so we launched uh, Project Taranga last year. It's a Senegalese word for hospitality, community, and belonging. And it's uh, we partner with school districts, public school districts around the country to implement our model. So we launched it with Bowling Green, Kentucky last year, and it's surpassed all our expectations. And we've got two more districts lined up for 23, and then we'll have four for the following year, and then hopefully it will spread. And then the, you know, like our current schools are, you know, the incubators for innovation. But then you have to figure out how to disseminate that innovation or it's useless, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't just sit on something. And, and so, yeah, hopefully it will be all over the country the same, you know, like when we receive new students into the country, they're received more humanely. I feel and like that's an evergreen, yeah. just you have so many kids coming every day. Every day, every day. And I think districts are overwhelmed, communities are overwhelmed. We tend to demonize them because we don't understand them. And it's like, sit down and have a conversation or pull out a soccer ball and play. You know, that's the universal language. Like, stop finding reasons why you can't connect with someone or why you think they might be taking away from you. Like, nobody's taking away from anyone, right? We all are basically the same. We yeah. want to be loved. We want to know where our next meal is coming mm -hmm. from, and we want a safe place. Yep. That's it. And we want to play soccer, right? And to it's play like, soccer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Mackenzie Scott donated $10 million to your schools. <laughs> yeah. What was your reaction, and what do you plan to do with the money? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was insane. Um, <laughs> we got do, the phone. do you have a little phone call, Zoom, of your face when it there happened? There was no Zoom. It was a phone call. Oh. But yeah, it was a phone call, and um, it lasted, I think, maybe 10 minutes. Um, so the person called and you know, said, I represent the donor that the email is about, you know, and we're giving you $10 million. She mentioned Mackenzie Scott's name. My heart, like, dropped. Like, I had a number of friends that received that grant. And I was like, oh, shit. And I was like, wait, 10 million? Like 10, like is it one, 10? No, I was like, is it one or 10? <laughs> and it's like 10, and I'm like, I just started sobbing. Like, that's the call you want, right? Like, um, like we'd slowly been getting more people to support us, and we had a, a big uh, anonymous donor come in like eight months prior, you know, to help launch the Taranga work. But like this now, we can breathe. You know, I don't have a knot in my stomach every single day. I'm not watching the bank account. I'm not, and we can scale. Like, we can scale a lot faster than we thought we could. Um, Worry about the work and not the money coming in. Right? That's great. It's, like, so refreshing to be like, no, we can do the work, and we don't have to, like, play this dog and pony show every day. And it's made everybody on our team just relax and breathe. And it's nice when somebody gets it, too. Yeah. They yeah. get it. They do get enough it. Enough to put some money behind yeah. it. Yeah. So you decided to write a book about your experience called Learning America, mm -hmm. One Woman's Fight for Educational Justice for Refugee, Refugee Children. How did writing the book influence how you saw your work past, present, and future? So I wrote the book during the pandemic. Um, it was very therapeutic. You know, like every day for two hours, um, trying to pick which stories to tell, um, and then kind of reflecting. Like I'd never, you know, when you do this work, it's go, go, go all the time. It's like when you're writing, you get to actually reflect back and highs and lows. Like the book isn't like this like superhero story. It's like it talks about the mess, it talks about the hard work, it talks about the ups and downs, it talks about not meeting payroll, and mm -hmm. some kids like we couldn't do it right, and then we had to adjust. Like why did we fail them? You know. Um, and it's like the book I wish I had when I started this work, because so many books, I think, um, over-romanticize sometimes this work and 
You're like, oh, this shit is hard. Yeah. <laughs> you have to eat a lot of ramen. <laughs> you know, you gotta like, um, and it's a roller coaster. Um, and then it made me dig into what we want to do. Um, because before the pandemic, we were just going to open more charters, more voucher schools. And we realized we'd have a sliver of the impact that we would if we decided to like partner with with districts and have them push mm -hmm. against policies and practice that weren't working. Much more effective to build like a coalition and a movement that way. And now that you already wrote the book, yeah. the next person in your particular situation they have had start, will have right? that <laughs> empathy and know, oh, okay, yep. this is what I'm getting yeah. into. I'm ready for yeah. it. Yeah. So you're a refugee activist. Yeah. What are some of the bi biggest misconceptions about refugees? That we're not capable. Um, you know, people center trauma as front and center of our identity instead of resilience, right? But you think about it, like if you had to leave your country, start over in a new place, um, in a language you're not familiar, in a culture you don't understand, like you're resilient, you're strong. You know, learning a new language is easy at that point. And I wish people would see our assets first, not our deficits. Like, what do we bring? Right? It's brave. Yeah. It's hard, yeah. and to be able to do that makes you a better person. Mm -hmm. And stronger Strong. Yep. So if you were in charge of U.S. immigration policies, what changes would you make? Simple, easy question. <laughs> um, I would open up the borders. Yeah. I would just open it up. Um, because if those countries are not treating their people with dignity and the people leave, then they will no longer have a people to govern and then American values spread wider, right? Um, but the way we do it, we criminalize it. You know, like I had to go through asylum. I had to prove like I would get killed, like I was guilty until proven innocent, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just, it's not a process people should go through. Um, like what would it take for you to leave your home here? It would take a lot. Yeah, yeah. and all the people coming in, like, it's not easy. It's not like, oh, money's growing on trees here. It's hard. And you're leaving everything behind. Like, just come on in. Help us, right? And, and we kind of need that infusion of, like, for people to, like, bring us back to what the Amer American dream is. And that's what immigrants and refugees do every day, right? Like, they don't take the freedoms here in this country for granted. Um, so I would open up the borders, which is probably what people don't want to hear. But I wouldn't do what the past this administration and the one before it is doing. So how can American citizens be more supportive of refugee and immigrant families? What are some of the needs that might not immediately come to mind? I mean, I think it's be a good neighbor. Like, if someone's coming into your community, what would you do? You know, go meet them, go talk to them. Um, there's a lot of obstacles. Like, I was just talking to a friend, and he's trying to help some Afghan refugees get their driver's license. And he's like, the test is only in English. I'm like. Yeah, I said, do they read it? He's like, no, 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 it's only written. So some states allow it to be read. Uh, the state he's in doesn't. Um, and so these families can't get to work because there's no public transportation in their city. And I'm like, why? They know how to drive. Like, why are we testing it in English and they have to read? Like, I, I just, like, some of these obstacles, you're like, why do we have these things in place? Um, yeah, it's like what prevents people from accessing jobs. And it's not only a refugee and immigrant issue. Like, transportation is a big issue for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So soccer mm -hmm. is a very international language and clearly the inspiration for your start. What's the hope for the World Cup, which is going to be played U.S., Mexico, Canada? Right. <laughs> is it, is, do, you, do you think that it's going to pump up your organization as well? I don't know. Like I, every time you know the U.S. hosts a soccer event, like things get bigger, more people have uh, excitement around it. I think this last World Cup got people into it because um, I think that was the best final I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. you know, it was like awesome. Um, I can't wait to go watch a few games live and take my kids to see it. Yeah, because uh, it's gonna be great. Um, I, ho I hope the U.S. starts uh, opening up access to the sport because I think if they open up access to the sport, then we'll have a super strong team. Who knows? Maybe you're training some of the next <laughs> World <laughs> Cup champions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Luma, for coming into the EDU thank you. studio. I really appreciate this, con this conversation. You have such a big, empathetic heart, and it shows. Thank you for having me.
All right, and thank you guys for joining us and all of you for watching. You can check out our daily schedule of interviews on our website at schedule.sxswedu.com. And you can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest EDU app and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at South by Southwest EDU. I'm Carrie Byron. Thank you for watching.